While the United States represents about 4.2% of the world's population, it houses around 20% of the world's prisoners. There were 1.8 million state and federal prisoners in mid-2020, and the numbers don't seem to be dropping much. How many of those inmates do you think were wrongfully accused and might see justice one day? From a man who went back to prison willingly to an inmate that served such a long sentence it earned him a Guinness World Record, here are 20 people who lived out insane prison sentences. Number 20. Joe Ligon this is yet another incredibly horrific story of an American inmate. When he was only 15 years old, a kid, Joe Ligon, was a shy teenager that didn't have many friends. On a Friday evening back in 1953, he was hanging out with a group of people he didn't know very well. In fact, he didn't even know their names, only their nicknames. They were all walking around the hood when they bumped into some other people who were drinking. Joe and his acquaintances started asking for money so they could also buy some more wine. Then one thing led to another and, evidently, things got way out of hand. The night ended with a horrible stabbing spree that left two people and six others injured. Ligon was the first to be arrested. The cops took him to a station far away from his home where they denied him legal help and kept his parents from seeing him for five days, which is illegal, especially considering he was underage. Ligon didn't anyone himself, but he admits he was involved in the events that took place that night. He was found guilty on two counts of first-degree murder and sentenced to mandatory life without the possibility of parole, which was unconstitutional for a juvenile. He served 68 years in prison, and eventually a lawyer that heard about his case decided to help him. The saddest part of the story is that Ligon himself had no idea that the justice system had failed him so miserably. Before we go on, like this video, smash the subscribe button, and click the notification bell right now, or this centipede will crawl on your face when you're sleeping. Number 19. Thomas Tarantino. I don't know what this man was thinking when he two policemen execution style back in 1963 in New Jersey. Everyone knows you don't cop and get away with it. Tarantino, who was 25 years old at the time of the crimes, did the deeds with a man called Frank Falco. Both of them still whipped and the two officers in August. Falco was a few days later and Tarantino turned himself in. Of course, he was sentenced to the electric chair, but his sentence was commuted to life in prison when the U.S. Supreme Court abolished the death penalty in 1972. This caused numerous angry protests in the town of Lodi, where the Occurred. Tarantino was quite industrious in prison. He sold his artwork and his autobiography. In 1980, he was granted parole. However, the New Jersey court elected to keep him in prison due to the nature of his crimes. He was denied again in 1982, and then further revisions to parole law in 84 made it so that Tarantino couldn't apply again until 1992, except on one condition, good behavior. So in 1988, after four years of good behavior, he applied once more more, and once more, he was denied. He was denied again in 1990, 1998, and 1999. He was finally released on February 11, 2002, on his 64th birthday. Once free, Tarantino became a motivational speaker. Number 18. Ricky Jackson Ricky was a teenage boy living in Cleveland, Ohio, when he was wrongfully accused of and sentenced to death. This incredibly sad story took place in 1975 when the murder and robbery of a man called Harold Franks occurred. The police, not being able to find the real culprit, decided to coerce a 13-year-old child to give false eyewitness testimony accusing Ricky and his two brothers, Ronnie and Wiley Bridgman. The young eyewitness, Eddie Vernon, was later to play a central role in the exoneration of the three innocent men. The police didn't have any physical or forensic evidence linking the three brothers to the crime, and none of them had any prior criminal record. Not only that, but the defense provided all three of them with credible and corroborated alibis. Nevertheless, seeing as the justice system doesn't seem to be very fair to black people in the U.S., the three juveniles were sentenced to death. Anyway, Ricky was considered the actual 
so he was never granted parole. He would end up serving 39 years, 3 months, and 9 days, making him the longest serving exonerated inmate in the history of the United States. Number 17. Otis Johnson Sentenced by the justice system at the young age of 25 for attempted murder of a police officer, Otis Johnson spent 44 years behind bars. However, he has always maintained his innocence. There's a very reasonable possibility that the cops arrested him on false suspicion. Released in 2014, he discovered a very different world from the one he left. The 69, nice, year old man explains he now spends a long time scrutinizing what's going on around him. He went down to Times Square and observed the atmosphere, the new things that were happening. What caught his attention? People's attitude in an ultra-connected world. He saw that everyone, or rather most people, were talking to themselves. When he looked closer, they seemed to have things in their ears. A phone something, iPhone or something like that, he said, completely puzzled. At one point, he wondered if everyone had become a CIA agent or something of the sort. You know, like being in a movie. Otis goes from surprise to amazement, talking about supermarkets and products he didn't know before. He was also amazed by rising prices. To make a phone call, he now has to put a dollar in a booth when he only placed 25 cents before his incarceration. However, for someone who has spent a third of his life in prison, he remains lucid and full of energy. Number 16. Betty Smithy Meet the longest-serving female inmate that went free in Arizona after almost half a century behind bars. In 1963, Betty Smithy walked into prison with a life sentence for a horrific 49 years later, she walked out with a cane. Betty has a long story of serious mental illness. It all culminated when she month old baby. The name of the child was Sandy Gerbrick, who she strangled while she was babysitting her. Because of the gruesome nature of her crime, Betty was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Nevertheless, she did make several appeals, all of which went unfulfilled for decades. Under the Arizona law, only an acting governor can grant clemency to an inmate. Eventually, acting governor Jan Brewer lowered her sentence to 48 years to life. Eventually, Betty told the Arizona Board of Executive Clemency that a letter of forgiveness from Sandy's mother sent to her 19 years after the crime inspired her to turn her life around. In her own words, if the mom could do that, then it was her responsibility to try and become a better person. Ever since she read the letter, little Little by little, she managed to become a different human being. It just goes to show the immense power that forgiveness has on people. Number 15. John Sonny Franzese Sonny was your typical monster. He was an Italian-born American criminal who was a longtime member and even underboss of the notorious Colombo crime family, the youngest of the five families that dominated organized crime activities in New York City within the criminal organization known as the American Mafia. Sonny's career in organized crime started in the 1930s and spanned over eight decades. A very flourishing career, by all means. He served as underboss from 1963 until 1967, when he was sentenced to 50 years in prison for orchestrating a series of bank across the United States. And even though he was paroled in 1978, he was re-jailed at least six times throughout the following decades, mostly because of parole violations. In 2005, he became the Colombo family underboss once more, but again, not for long. In 2011, he was sentenced to eight years for extortion. His son, John Franzese Jr., testified against him, becoming the first ever son of a New York to turn state's evidence. I guess he didn't want to follow his dad's footsteps. Sonny was released on June 23, 2017, at the age of 100. At the time, he was the oldest federal inmate in the U.S. and the only centenarian in federal custody. Number 14. Sheldry Top Top was only 17 years old when he was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole in a Michigan County court. To put things into perspective, John F. Kennedy was the President of the United States the last time that Top took a step as a free person. And now, after 56 long years of being incarcerated, Top left prison a free man. 
the first thing he did, he headed for a steak dinner with his brother. Top was the oldest juvenile lifer, as they call him, in Michigan before his release. There were two crucial U.S. Supreme Court decisions that made his freedom possible. In 2012, the Supreme Court decided that sentencing a minor to an automatic sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole is unconstitutional and represented cruel and unusual punishment. This also applied if the juvenile was convicted of which was Topps' case. Then, in 2016, the Supreme Court ruled that the law should be applied to all inmates retroactively, meaning that if a prisoner was convicted years before this law passed, it still applies to them today. This major change gave Topp a chance to ask for parole. Even though kids can still commit gruesome but we need to always remember they're only kids after all. They should never be put up to the same standards as adults, and evidently, the Supreme Court agrees. Number 13. Bill Wallace In 1962, Wallace was calmly sitting in the Waterloo Cafe on King Street in Melbourne, Australia, when another man entered the establishment. He sat down and lit up a cig. This was back when f***ing was allowed everywhere. Wallace didn't like this and asked the man to please put out but the man refused. What happened next is all conjecture, as nobody's been able to prove anything to this day. Allegedly, Wallace waited for the man outside in the street him as he exited the cafe. A police officer who was nearby heard the shot and ran to the scene of the immediately arresting Wallace. But Wallace never answered any questions and never admitted to the he was found unfit to plead and was declared insane by two different doctors. He was sentenced to be held at a lunatic asylum called J. Ward at the governor's pleasure, which means that if he could convince the governor that he was cured, he would have gone free. But once again, Wallace refused to speak to the doctors, so he was never released. He ended up spending 57 years at J. Ward and seven others at Airedale. He died at the age of 108 in his cell. Ironically, Wallace became one of the heaviest smokers in the asylum. Number 12. Eddie Collins In the summer of 1973, Eddie and his brother Johnny Collins got caught up in a deal in Tucson, Arizona. Unfortunately, a fight broke out and a man called Terry Young got shot and was His brother, who was the actual shooter, took a plea deal and only served 10 years in prison, and yet Eddie opted for a jury trial and was sentenced to life in prison. He ended up spending 44 years behind bars for a crime he didn't commit. The Arizona Justice Project and Pima County Conviction Integrity Unit got involved in Eddie's case because they believed his role in the didn't fit a life sentence. For starters, Eddie didn't know his brother had a and neither of them wanted to but he was nevertheless convicted based on an old code, which happened to change only two months after his offense. That law change would have made him eligible for parole after 25 years, but now his only option was to request clemency, which is extremely difficult to obtain. His case went on for years and had many ups and downs, but eventually Collins managed to prove to the parole board that he could live as a law-abiding citizen and he was released, although under certain restrictions. Number 11. Vincent Simmons Yet again, another story of a black man that was treated completely unfairly by the justice system in the United States. Vincent Simmons spent 44 years behind bars on charges and was released this year after a judge ruled he didn't get a fair trial. Simmons, from Louisiana, has always denied his conviction of attempted aggravated he is now 69 years old and was convicted by a jury of 11 white men and one black woman back in 1977 and sentenced to 100 years in prison. The victims of the attempted assault were 14-year-old twin sisters named Karen and Sharon, also white. Since his conviction, Simmons tried about 16 times to get a new trial, but was denied every time until CBS News reported that key pieces of evidence were not shared with his original defense team, which is completely illegal. They kept from the trial the testimony of the doctor who examined the teenage girls, who found no signs of sex assault whatsoever on either of them, not even a single bruise. They also kept from the trial the fact that the girls originally told police they had no idea who assaulted them, saying that all black people look alike. Number 10. Kevin Strickland Strickland was only a teenager when he was wrongfully accused of three gruesome 
As a result, he spent more than four decades in prison and was finally released in 2021. Strickland, a Kansas City citizen, is now a 63-year-old man and he has spent most of his life jailed for a crime he didn't commit. He always maintained his innocence, telling police officers he was at home watching a soap opera at the time of the but nobody believed him. Ironically, he learned of the decision to free him when the news scrolled across the TV screen while he was watching, again, a soap opera in prison. Apparently, his fellow inmates started screaming in joy for him. Now a free man, he finds it very difficult to figure out his emotions. Joy, sorrow, fear, but necessarily anger is what he feels on a day-to-day -day basis. It's a lot. He now wishes to get involved in efforts to keep what happened to him from happening to anyone else. He thinks the justice system in the United States needs to be torn down and redone, especially for those who belong to minorities. Number 9. Richard Phillips This man spent 46 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit and made a plan to kill the man who framed him. It sounds like the plot of a Hollywood movie, doesn't it? But believe me, it's real. He was 26 years old when he was wrongfully sentenced. He knew he would never be able to hold his kids again unless he somehow managed to prove his innocence in a system dedicated to keeping African American people behind bars. Phillips decided to appeal twice in 1974 and 75, but he was denied both times. That's when he thought that maybe a better lawyer would help, but good lawyers are expensive. So he took a job at the prison's license plate factory where he made $100 a month. He worked there for four years, and that's when he managed to accumulate enough money to pay one of the best appellate lawyers in Michigan. He sent the money and waited for freedom. He waited and waited until eventually, in 2018, he managed to prove his innocence without that lawyer. Not only that, but seeing as a law passed in 2016 dictated that all exonerated ex-inmates be paid $50,000 for each year spent in prison, he is now owed $1.5 million. Although that money will not bring back the lost decades spent behind bars, it's a start. Richard Phillips has served the longest known wrongful prison sentence in American history, and he never did the man who framed him after all. Number 8. Desmond Rex This is the story of a man who wrongfully spent 25 years in prison because police officers switched to frame him for back in 1992. Desmond Rex was 26 years old when he was convicted of friend of his outside a restaurant. After the crime, the police seized a belonged to Rick's mother and claimed it was the weapon, even though they knew perfectly well it wasn't. Not only that, but the cops also withheld evidence during the investigation. However, Ricks always maintained his innocence. It wasn't until the National Capital Crime Assistance Network got involved that he managed to prove his innocence and the involvement of the corrupt police officers and the police ballistic lab in his wrongful conviction. It's from the fatal sh did not resemble in any way, shape, or form the bullets that were examined during his trial. This case was layer upon layer of police misconduct. A free man, Ricks enjoyed five years of freedom until he decided to file a $125 million civil rights lawsuit seeking compensation and punitive damages for the violations of his constitutional rights. He ended up winning $7.5 million. Number 7. Glenn Ford This is Glenn Ford, an innocent man that spent almost 30 years in Angola's throw for a crime he had nothing to do with. He was eventually released in 2014 after his conviction was vacated. Month to month, a year after his release, Ford sued former and current prosecutors, police, as well as prison officials and doctors because he was denied medical care following a cancer diagnosis that took place in prison that later became terminal. This is the perfect example of how the justice in prison systems not only convict and punish innocent people, but also how inmates are not treated like human beings. Nobody should ever be denied medical care, no matter their situation. He filed two separate lawsuits. One of them details misleading testimony and evidence suppression that kept him behind bars and subjected to deplorable conditions for much of his adult life. He was convicted in December of 1984 by an all-white jury in Louisiana, 
all know what that means. He has always maintained his innocence, even throughout the trial, but to no avail. Not only that, but now that he is a free man, they are nevertheless denying him compensation mandated under state law for those wrongfully convicted. How much longer is the justice system going to fail this man? Number 6. Harvey Stewart Stewart's life has been like a revolving door in and out of prison. He first entered the prison system to serve 10 years for robbing a junkyard, but he was paroled six years into his sentence. In 1958, Stewart returned to prison after being convicted of but he managed to escape in 1965, only to be captured a few days later. In 1984, he made parole, but was rejailed in 1986 on a robbery charge. In the state of Texas, which has approximately 166,000 inmates, Harvey Stewart has served the most amount of time in prison, close to six decades. In fact, he was one of the longest serving prisoners in the whole of the United States. Today, Stewart's an old man that doesn't look threatening at all, but he still recalls how he used to rob brothels in southwest Texas when he was a young man. During his life, he has been shot, he a man, he claims it was self-defense, and he committed many robberies. But he's not one to romanticize his criminal past, as there are very real consequences to being an outlaw. When he talks about prison, he says, quote, I wouldn't recommend it. Man's gotta be a damn fool to even stick his foot in there. Number 5. Howard Christensen you would think that spending 58 years locked up would make a man more agreeable, right? Well, in the case of Howard Christensen, it had the exact opposite effect. His long sentence has not only made him the longest serving inmate, but it's also made him more cantankerous and testier than ever. In fact, Christensen is so unpleasant that prison officials were worried that other inmates would attack him. He has systematically harassed visitors, refused to change his clothes, or even bathe. Prison doctors have given him several rounds of electric shock treatments and even considered giving him a frontal lobotomy to make him more docile, which would have been a little bit of an overreaction and perhaps even illegal. Now, prison officials have had more than enough with this misbehaving elderly prisoner and they've decided the best solution is to put him in a nursing home, if they can find one that would accept him, of course. There's no prison geriatric in South Dakota that could take him either. All this story tells us is that many states in the US are very ill-equipped to deal with aging prison populations, and that prison doesn't necessarily have the effect officials would like to think. Number 4. Charles Edrett Ford Charles Ford became a free man at age 84 after 64 long years incarcerated. In March 2016, the Charles County Circuit Court Judge H. James West and the Charles County Assistant State's Attorney John Stackhouse agreed that Mr. Ford should be sentenced to unsupervised probation and should be released from jail in the Maryland Department of Corrections in Jessup. Ford had to agree to an Alford plea in a 1975 assault case, an incident that took place when Ford was out of prison on furlough from a 1952 first-degree conviction. Now, I had to look it up. Apparently, an Alford plea is a type of guilty plea where a defendant doesn't admit that they did the crime, but admits that the evidence is strong enough that they'll probably be found guilty. But Ford didn't embark on his journey on his own. Since early 2014, defense attorneys William Renahan and Mary Pizzo have represented him pro bono. They managed to present a convincing argument that Mr. Ford had been convicted by an all-white jury in segregated Charles County, a conviction which, by all means, should be and was thrown out. Back then, the judge even failed to appraise Ford of his post-trial rights. The world has changed a lot since he went to prison for the first time, but it's important to remember history. Every African-American person that was convicted during the time of segregation should have their situation reviewed. You would think that would be the case, right? Number 3. Richard Honeck Richard Honeck was born in 1879 and died in 1976. At the time of his incarceration, he served the longest prison sentence ever to end in a release. It all started in November 1899 when he was accused of a former school friend of his. He was eventually paroled on December 20th, 1963, having spent 64 years and one month of his life sentence behind bars. In all his time in prison, he only received a single letter, which was a four-line note from his brother, and two visits, a friend in 1904 and a newspaper reporter in 1963 when his case came to public notice. 
Back in the day, he was a telegraph operator and the son of a rather wealthy dealer in farm equipment, but somewhere down the road, things went terribly wrong for Honeck. When he was 21 years old, him and Herman Hundhausen decided to go to the victim's room armed to the teeth with an 8-inch a 16-inch Bowie knife, a silver-plated case knife, a 44 caliber revolver, a 38 caliber revolver, a 22 caliber revolver, a club, and two belts of cartridges. These boys were ready for war. They even had two getaway satchels filled with dime novels, obscene etchings, and clothes. It was a revenge. The victim had testified for the prosecution against the two young men, who were then charged with setting several fires in their hometown. Number 2. Johnson Van Dyke Grigsby This is the man who willingly went back to prison after being set free. Johnson was sentenced to life in prison after a man he was having a drink with at a bar. Him and Mr. Brown were playing poker and started fighting over a gambling debt. Racial slurs and curses started flying and Mr. Brown on Grigsby, who left the saloon but just to go home and grab a knife of his own. When Brown saw Grigsby coming back to the bar, he threw a chair at him, he dodged it, and then attacked him with his He stabbed him to death. He was arrested in 1908 and sent to prison, but was pardoned in 1974 after serving 66 years of his life sentence. He was 89 years old at the time of his release, but he decided to go back to prison for several reasons. For starters, no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't find a job. Nobody was willing to employ such an elderly ex-convict. Also, after spending so many decades behind bars, he lacked any experience that would make him a valuable employee. For this reason, he found it extremely difficult to put food on the table. He was also incredibly confused by the world. He hated cars and preferred horses. It got to the point that he rarely ventured outside of his front porch until he decided to go back to prison, a world he knew best. Number 1. Paul Geidel Meet the longest-serving prison inmate in the U.S. whose sentence ended with parole. He even earned a place in the Guinness Book of World Records for it. Imagine that! In 1911, when Geidel was only 17 years old, he was accused and convicted of second-degree murder. He ended up spending 68 years and 296 days jailed in various New York State prisons during that time. Eventually, he was released on May 7, 1980, when he was 86 years old. Geidel was the son of an alcoholic saloon keeper and his German-born wife. His dad died when he was a five-year-old child. He had spent much of his childhood in an orphanage and dropped out of school at the age of 14. After that, he held various jobs in different hotels in New York City. On July 26, 1911, he robbed and killed William H. Jackson, an elderly and very wealthy broker. The victim was a guest at the Iroquois Hotel on West 44th Street in New York, where the teenager was working as a bellhop. He entered Jackson's room and suffocated him with a rag filled with chloroform. Ironically, he only found a few dollars. As you can see, not everybody that is sentenced is guilty, and not everybody that is released is innocent. Things are never that simple. But what about you? What changes would you like seeing in the justice system to make it fairer? Tell us about it. Also, check out our other cool stuff showing up on screen right now. See you next time.